Welcome to Uptown Rumble, Heavy Music in the Bronx. My name is Stephen Payne, Director of the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is February 20th, 2024, and here for an oral history, um, I'll let John introduce himself, but uh, around the band Arsenic in the Bronx, uh, really, really interesting history that we're going to learn about today and record. So John, why don't you say a little bit about yourself, um, just a sentence or two, and about Arsenic. And then we'll we'll take it back. All righty. My name is John Isaac. Um, I was the bass player in 1980s death metal band Arsenic. Uh, we had some other projects we did along the way, which I guess we couldn't talk about. And the latest thing I do is something called God Shroud that I started with my brother, and I do alone since the pandemic. Thank you, thank you, John. Really happy to have you uh, here today, and. Um, and yeah, to record this amazing history. Um, so why don't you start off by talking a little bit about your own family history and background and how your family ended up in the Bronx, where they ended up and all of that. Um, family came from Cuba. My parents uh, came in 1960 and I was born in 61. Um, we lived, I believe, at some point with my aunt and uncle who had come before them uh, in the South Bronx as well. And uh, that's pretty much it. They they uh, came as the Castro regime was kind of kicking in. I see. And do you know where your uh, other family members lived in the Bronx? Um, they lived in Southern Boulevard area. I think it was like Vice Avenue, that kind of uh, area. And then we ended up moving into the projects at the uh, at the. Uh, beginning of them 1965 when they first opened uh, uh, I projects Mitchell, Mitchell houses huh yep um and so you were you were born in the u.s is that right or were you or were you born in cuba francis hospital in the south bronx aha uh -huh. i see i see um did your parents have other children before you or were you the first i'm the first and first in my uh, family Wow. And just the one brother, too, right, Henry? My brother, Henry, yes, the younger brother. I'm I five. See. I see five years older. Okay. Um, and what are some of your earliest memories? Uh, it could be in Mitchell Houses, it could be elsewhere, but just some of the earliest memories that you have. I mean, I have a ton of early memories. I remember... I mean, it's funny because at that time frame in the 60s, there was so much historical things going on and I can kind of remember them. I don't remember actually being there at the moment, but I remember them happening, like obviously the issues with uh, Vietnam, the Kennedys, the moon landing, like a lot of those things being in my childhood. Um, even if I wasn't totally on top of it because my parents would watch the news and they'd make a big deal of it. I kind of remember a lot of it through that. Um, the space thing in the sixties was a big deal. I remember being a space nerd and wanting to be an astronaut and that whole deal. Um, and obviously there was just so much culture stuff going on and so much stuff in the news in, in that time period. So the Beatles. Uh, being a big deal. Um, I know I watched it. I can't tell you that I remember watching it. Um, but I know my parents used to watch TV and watch Lawrence Welk. So I'm sure they weren't Beatles fans. But because they showed up on the given night that I was sitting with them watching it, it kind of like hit that chord. And I was a Beatles fan at that point. Wow. Wow. Um, were there, aside from your you know extended family, were there other... Uh, Cubans that were in the Bronx that your family knew of or was close to? There were a bunch that came together around the same time. And um, a lot of them ended up working together. So once one would get a job, say like in a factory or something, they would kind of get like, hey, my buddy needs a job and that kind of thing. So a lot of them ended up working together. Um, as a kid, I remember having, and I have photos of it, having birthday parties that there's no kids at. Because I was wow. the only at the time. I was the only child at the time. So it's my parents and all their Cuban friends and me and a birthday cake. So <laughs> the oddity of like, and I usually show the photo and I go, what's wrong with this photo? There's no kids at a kid's birthday party. What, you know, what the hell is this? But that's 
didn't have kids, so I was spoiled. I was spoiled. Everybody carried me around, and everybody bought presents for me because there was nobody else. Um, yeah. so kind of like a funny time, and uh, just you know, birthday parties where again, very minimal amount of children, uh, a, a lot of older C Cubans uh, dancing around and, you know, having a fun time. Um, the kids that ended up being at our parties were um, neighbors. Sure. Neighbors that my parents and my aunt and uncle who lived in the next building over were friends with. And those are the kids that we had at our birthday parties. And then we'd go uh -huh. to their same kind of boat. So that's how that kind of started off, but it was very much um, new to all of them. Uh, my mom did not have much English language grasp at that point. And my dad speaks some English, even though he was very much, uh, you know, the, the accent made you think more of I love Lucy than anything else. And, you know, so uh, of course, when we got older, we made fun of it. It was just kind of like, like, oh, Jesus, all right, just stick to Spanish. <laughs> but, it was, but it was just a funny time. Um, my parents, having come from Cuba, didn't speak a great deal of English. Um, my dad spoke a little, my mom none. And so um, I learned Spanish from them as a kid uh, growing up. And then as I got a little older, I wanted to kind of learn how to read and write as well in Spanish. Um, so I would get like, uh, they would get the Spanish newspapers and I would try to sit there and, and read them and then just write things out and have them help me if I made a mistake. But I went to school not speaking English. Um, yeah. as, as a kid, there were some kids who thought I was shy and realistically I just couldn't speak English. Um, yeah. so, um, so I think it wasn't until about third grade where it really hit because by that point, your math starts having word problems. <clears throat> and word problems are confusing anyway to any Yeah, they are. Someone who's not fully on, you know, up on the language. So um, my grades are crappy. I'm a crappy third grader. And, <laughs> uh, you know, oh, you're a shitty third grader. We're going to have to call your parents in. So uh, my parents have to come to school. And they're sitting down with them. And they're going over, you know, uh, you know Johnny's fucking idiot. And it's like, no, I'm not stupid. I just don't know English. So For sure. That's what comes out. It comes out like, oh, he doesn't know English. Oh, that's a world of difference. It's not like he just is a dumbass. It's just, and I don't know why they didn't figure it out in the first couple of years. I don't know if it was just adequate enough that they're like, okay, maybe he's just slow or yeah. whatever. But <clears throat> by that point where it was necessary um, to not just have it for speaking purposes or whatever where i needed it for the math part um it came out to the school that i did not know english or at least enough to you know get by so um it changed everything i had to work really hard i had to do a lot of reading i had dictionaries i had encyclopedias i had a thesaurus i had anything that would explain anything to me wow uh, that point on, and then I think in, I want to say, like seventh or eighth grade, I had a third grade reading level. Um, but then in high school, because I kept at it, it eventually came up and then surpassed. Sure. But it took, took many years. It took many years. My brother didn't have that problem because he came after. So I spoke English. So uh, I, spoke. I see. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to. I was I was going to ask if if uh, if Henry ever had the urge to write any lyrics in Spanish, but I guess he wasn't as immersed in Spanish as you were at an early age, huh? Uh, you know, just speaking to my aunt and uncle, and my parents, and things like that. Yeah. But he he wasn't tied into it. I see. As I was. I see. Um, he was learning English in school, but I spoke English. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. He had somebody at home to bounce off sure and then the funny thing was we become teenagers and we could speak about things with my parents in the room <laughs> so, so we're talking all kinds of stuff with them right in the room and then <laughs> it was one day my mom said i know what that means and it was like <laughs> <laughs> but 
<laughs> we used to all the time be like, blah, 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 blah. you know. And uh, yeah, it got to the point where, you know, they had been around long enough that my mom was like, I know what you're saying. And it's like, that's it. <laughs> Big is no more of that. But yeah, no, it was just, uh, it was just one of those funny things, you know, growing up like that. Um, it's funny when people find out because, you know, I don't think I have a, an accent to, you know, to uh, at least enough to show. No, no that, uh, not at all. Hispanic, um, but the fact that I learned English second, so you know, and, I, and obviously I feel way more articulate in English than I do in Spanish because sure. I was a Spanish, so it, my Spanish only goes so far. I, I call it kids Spanish. Yeah, you know, yeah. Words, you know, I use the words my parents taught me, so I, you know, I know a little kid Spanish. Um, so, what what your parents um, do for work uh, while you were growing up? Uh, my dad worked in a factory. I believe it was uh, a company that made paper products. Okay, yeah, sure. Because he had a little bit of English, I believe he became like uh, a foreman of some sort at the place of work. And my mom uh, was raising me and my brother. I see. So sure, sure, sure. He did his, uh, there was a factory nearby, and she would get uh, piecework. I see. Bring it home and bring it back to them and they'd give her a few bucks. And then later on, when I got older and moved out and everything like that, I believe she worked. Uh, we have a elementary school right down the street and she worked there like serving lunches and things like that. So she had little little jobs, but she didn't sure. really work like that. She sure. Stayed- and um, what what kind of uh, we're going to get you know, very deep into music here in a, in a few minutes, of course, but what kind of, what kind of music do you remember hearing your parents listen to or your parents' friends listen to or neighbors listen to? Like describe the kind of musical uh, environment you grew up in. Yeah, a lot of uh, Cuban music. Um, it's, it's not, you know, if, if you've heard uh, Spanish music, it's not sure. like the normally think it's, uh, there were orchestras. So yeah. it was a lot, it had a lot of uh, instruments in it, and it was dancey, but it wasn't that kind of dance music, if you sure. know what I'm saying. Um, but they weren't very big on music. Um, they would play it if they had parties and people came over and whatever, but it wasn't the kind of thing like I heard music throughout the house. Sure, uh, I see. Growing up, I had a record player in the bedroom, and I started getting into music at a really young age. Like I guess it started off with like the Beatles and uh, my dad got us the Columbia House record deal thing. <laughs> where get the albums. That, um, but because he wasn't, because he wasn't knowledgeable on, on how to do it, we got whatever the album of the month was, for example. So we didn't pick out anything. We just got whatever they sent out every month. So I you see. can imagine variety of music that showed up at the house never really made sense it was you know something that would have been like rock to something that's like bossa nova and you're just getting like just whatever the album of the uh, month was but we would get it and we'd play it and be like okay that's kind of interesting whatever and it's like oh i don't like that one or you know whatever but it gave us a chance to listen to a lot of music i would have never heard uh Absolutely. motown uh, I remember getting the Woodstock, um, uh, the uh, Woodstock album. Sure. So I got turned on to like Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. I got turned on to stuff I would have never really heard on my own because I'm a little kid in the South Bronx whose parents don't really listen to music, and I don't have any, you know, I don't have money at that point to yeah. go and buy something I like, and I don't even know what I like. You know, whatever shows up, I go, okay, I like that. I don't like that, and. That's how that kind of started off. I see, I see. And and uh, why don't you talk a little bit more before we, you know, get more into your musical development, a little bit more about um, the Mitchell Houses and uh, what growing up in the Mitchell Houses was like for you. Um, when we got there, it was a brand new uh, project. So yeah. everything was so much different than how it ended up. Um, we had police patrols we had i remember you know keep off the grass signs uh-huh which is, uh-huh which is funny 
uh, because we'd run on the grass and we'd get yelled at, you know, to get off the grass. <laughs> and uh, it got to the point they installed like thorn bushes at the en entrances where to keep the kids from running up on the grass. Um, we have park benches, but if you sat, as we like to sit, with your behind on the top part and your feet where you're supposed to sit, uh huh, you would come by and yell at you and tell you, "Hey, don't sit like that. Sit right." You know. So it was really funny how how you know it was like that at the beginning, and uh, you know a lot of services in the building. Uh, sure. That kind of I guess just with time with budget cuts and things kind of went away. And they just kind of got poorer and poorer until it became, you know, kind of like a lot of drugs and issues like that. But yeah. enough growing up in it, I don't think of it as, I never thought of it as something bad until you move away and grow up and then look back at it and go, oh, that was kind of dangerous or that was kind of tough or whatever. But at the time, it wasn't like that at all. It was like any kid. And whatever happened, you figure it happens to anyone in any neighborhood and we weren't really worried about crime or scared about you know going out at night or you know we didn't have cell phones we didn't have you know it was just like going out with my friends see you in about yeah. eight hours and you'd go out with your friends in the summertime at you know 10 o'clock in the morning and go home for dinner and then go back out and come home when you know it got dark out absolutely I'm, I'm sure it was dangerous it just wasn't dangerous. <laughs> sure. Um, and what about other other parents in the building or other adult figures in the building? Um, uh, did you experience what you know? A lot of people end up talking about where if they did anything before they got home, you know, all of the the adults would pass the news back to absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Everyone, everyone knew everybody else's parents. Uh -huh. uh, all looked out for everyone else. So yeah. it was that network of, you know, I saw your son down by whatever. And it's like, you know, so it kind of kept you where you kind of have to behave because, you know, all eyes are on you, even if they're not. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah, for sure. Like everybody, like I said, I went to elementary school right down the street, St. Jerome's. And so I'm still friends with a ton of those kids from then. They're yeah. my friends. And I know all their parents, you know, and they knew my parents and they'd come over and have dinner with us sometimes. And I'd go over there and have something to eat with, you know, it was just that kind of everybody in with everybody else and everybody's house was open to everybody. And very few people were kind of like, yeah, I don't really want these kids around. But for the most part, uh, if I wasn't home and one of my friends showed up, my mom would make them a plate if they were hungry. They'd be like, oh, it's just, yeah, yeah, he's not here. He's out. Um, do you want something? Because I just made some food. Sure, you know. Yeah. And oddly enough, you know, years later, I remember one of the guys that we knew who was friends with my brother said that the first time he ever had lasagna was my mom made it. <laughs> like that's kind of like an odd thing, but you know, it was just that kind of thing because everybody knew everybody, and we'd go to anybody's house at any point and uh, hang out and you know make noise and you know just that kind of, you know, indoor mayhem. Um, but I probably think that a lot of them felt that it was safer and better to at least know that we're there, even if we're destroying their apartment, <laughs> that nobody can find us or see us. Yeah, that's right. Um, so you mentioned, you mentioned your, your, your mom's lasagna already. What are other things that your mom, or if your dad cooked your dad too, things that you remember eating on a regular basis growing up in your house my mom was fantastic cook fantastic my dad didn't cook yeah and I, yeah. Was, <laughs> I wouldn't have cooked either if i had to go against her <laughs> uh, yeah she uh, made pretty much anything she could make anything uh, i loved her steak yeah she would make like steak like 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 no other like you can cut it without a, a knife um, wow! I think the secret was she used the pressure cooker. Oh wow! Okay, steaks, and then I believe she used them, made them in a pressure cooker, and wow. so they her and she'd make a bunch of them. And I can't say what cut it was or anything like that because again, I was you know too young to even yeah. know. But uh, that or you know made rice and beans, obviously. Um, 
plantains, uh, you know, just pretty much all Spanish fare. Um, yeah. And funny enough, as I became a teenager and hung out with my friends and wanted to kind of fit in with them, there were times it was kind of like, yeah, I don't want to have dinner today. I'm going to get some pizza. And she looked at me like, why the hell do you want pizza? Like, I made this. I go, I know. I know your food's great. But I just kind of like want to hang out with my friends. I just want like pizza. So she looked at me like, I don't know about you. You know, you're like turning this down for like, but you know, I'm sure they understood after a while. Like, hey, I'm just yeah. trying to fit. I don't want to be the odd kid. Like, you know, I was the odd kid anyhow, but I didn't want, <laughs> you know, I didn't want to be that odd kid. So, <laughs> um, and what, what are some, you, you've mentioned a little bit in passing it already, but, um, what are some of the things that you do for fun, either around the projects or around the wider neighborhood, things that you do for fun with your friends when you're growing up? I played a lot of sports. Oh, okay. Was, yeah. Sports. So um, we played pretty much anything imaginable that involved a ball. We played football, basketball, baseball, softball, handball, uh, paddle ball, uh, ball. I mean, we were out there all the time playing some kind of sport. We even got to the point we played uh, hockey. We played uh, wow. <laughs> hockey. So we played every sport you can come up with. Um, and also you have to think that because we're in the projects and there's, I believe it's 10 buildings, um, there's thousands of kids. Yep. So if you're waiting, for example, if you want to play basketball, you get to the court late. The, you know, there's a game going on and you want to call next. You might be the third or fourth next on the court. So you could be standing out there for an hour or two waiting to get on the uh -huh. court. Yeah, unless you got picked. But you never knew if you were going to get picked. So. Yeah. If you weren't going to get picked, you'd go and play stickball somewhere. And if, you know, if the stickball area was kind of like where we used to play stickball was kind of congested, you'd get a football and play football. So you'd always find something. We play Johnny and the Pony. I mean, we'd come up huh? with anything to kind of just keep going. We played handball. Um, yeah, anything. Just about any sport that you can think of, we played all the time, even out of season. We'd go and shovel the basketball court and shoot baskets in winter. Huh. Of course, yeah. it didn't work well, you know, because the air pressure goes dead on the ball and you try to dribble and kind of clunk. Uh -huh. Yeah, we we play year round. Wow. So. Um, and you mentioned you mentioned St. Jerome's already. Why don't you talk about your your years at St. Jerome's? Some. Uh, St. Jerome's Elementary School uh, tied into St. Jerome's Church. Yeah. Uh, right 138th Street and uh, right down the street from us. And so I went there uh, as a kid and uh, just a great experience. Just a great experience. I mean, well, obviously, there's always the moments where it's a little, you know, weird. But um, just I'm still in touch with one of my teachers from then. Wow. And uh, it was. It was just a fun time. And my friendship with the kids from that time I'm still friends with a lot of them and uh, just good people. They're just yeah. good people, um, which is a funny thing because I'm sure if, if as an outsider, if you said something about the South Bronx and growing up in the South Bronx, the first thing you think is like, oh, that must have been tough and this and that. And I go, it really was. It was like any other neighborhood. Uh -huh. It's just, you know, to us, it wasn't. To us, we were like anybody else. And like I said, because everybody knew everybody else's family, uh, people were, you know, pretty much on their best behavior. And once in a while, some kooky shit would go down, but yeah. it wasn't that kind of stuff. And then there was things that went down. I mean, you you might, you know, hear of a shooting or, you know, something really off kilter that went down or somebody got beaten with a bat or something, you know, that seems insane to happen. But realistically, we just thought this happens anywhere. Yeah. We didn't think yeah. like, oh, special, you know, there's special amount of crime for us. It's like, no, this happens anywhere. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and uh, what what grade did St. Jerome's cut off? Was that did it cut off at fifth grade or sixth grade? Eighth grade. Oh, eight, oh, okay. So it went all the way through, I guess, junior high, intermediate yeah, yeah. school. And, uh, ah, I see. Uh, high school. Wow. So okay. Okay. 
that because we all ended up applying and going to different high schools. So yeah. it was the first time we all like separated. Um, but then like after school, after everybody got home from school, whatever, we'd all be, meet back up in the neighborhood and play again, football, basketball, like whatever, you know, but a lot of my friends went to different schools and there were schools like, um, you had to take entrance exams. I don't know how it is today. I mean, it's, I'm so far removed, but you had to take entrance exam for a lot of the schools. And so you got the couple of schools you got into, and then you picked whichever one you were going to go to. But it's funny looking back now, and we're talking about this. It's like, you're trying to decide what high school to go to. That's going to be the best for you, but you're 13 years old. Uh-huh. And you don't know anything. You, you, nope. you yeah. just hope you made a good choice because you don't know. Or you're picking a buddy went to. Or you know, in my case, I'm picking a school that's closer to home because I don't feel like being on a train for two hours to get to school. Or, you know, my I have friends who went to aviation. And, wow. And I could have gone and, you know, they got jobs when they got out of, out of aviation and went on to work at Lockheed in California and made money that we didn't know how to spell yet. But <laughs> yeah. I feel like getting up at five o'clock in the morning to Absolutely. be there. So I was like, nope, not going there. Uh-huh. <laughs> like two hours to get there, two hours to get home, an eight-hour day. I'm like, no, 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 that's, that's my whole day. Like, what the hell? It is. It but is. I'm, 13, I'm thinking like a 13-year-old, you know? <laughs> so what, what high school did you end up going to then? So I went to All Hollows. All Hollows, that's right. Yep, on uh, 164th, right near uh, Yankee Stadium. Uh, I see. I ended up going there. So oh, we say, both, say that again. My brother went to All Hallows as well. Ah, uh, I see, I see, I see, I see. If we were apart, we were not there at the same time. I see, I see. What what was All Hallows like for you? Um, I liked All Hallows. Um, it was um, it was kind of a blur. Yeah, yeah. It, it just feels like. You know, it's funny because a couple of years back, the guys got together and had a reunion and I didn't go. And I remember talking to someone about it and they're like, oh, you didn't go to the anniversary, whatever. I go, yeah, I didn't go, whatever. And they're like, oh, it's too bad. You should have gone. You know, I go, got to be honest. I don't remember high school. It's just mm-hmm. so long ago. It's over 40 years ago. And it yep. was such a blur. It was just like, I'm a little kid. And next thing you know, I'm graduating. And it's like, I don't remember the four years there. Yeah. Um Obviously, I made friends and got along and with the school, and I wasn't the kid that cut classes or anything weird like that. So yeah. I was never that kid anyhow. So I just went every day, sat in front, you know, uh, learned what I learned, and then went off to college. Yeah. And the funny thing is uh, I sat in front because um, I, when uh, lunch came, I wanted to be able to get a jump on getting down there for lunch. Because if you were, that. oh, your lunch was really short. So <laughs> I sat in front of you like, oh, you're like, you know, you're one of those smart kids that sit in front of me like, hell no, I'm not smart. I'm sitting <laughs> lunch bell goes off. I'll be having, <laughs> I'll be up here horsing around with you. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Um, Pretty, so you know? do you, were, were, were there very many, or you, you might, you just might not have run into them at the at the catholic schools i mean i know in public schools right when you were coming up like the savage goals black spades like ghetto brothers like those kind of heard of them but i'm in contact with any well yeah it was you know more like street organizations or gangs that were you know a big deal in public schools but it sounds like you didn't you didn't have any run-ins with them at all no no we didn't our neighborhood pretty much was kept pretty clean yeah yeah didn't have we knew of these things but we didn't really have it happen in our in our part of the neighborhood the same thing with the fires yep we talked about that before and it's you know we knew of them and we knew like that can't be right that you hear you know fire engines every 15 minutes and there's a fire somewhere but because it wasn't right on top of us um it didn't affect us like that we knew it was crooked in some degree, but had no answer for it because it yeah. wasn't, it wasn't our deal. Yep. Yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah, J- Jimmy, Jimmy talked about this some too, but you know, it's like the projects, especially since you have so many right there and 
you know, next to the Mitchell Havas too, you have the Patterson, the Mott Haven, you know, and there's even more, but the big ones, I mean, they're a huge source of stability for those neighborhoods um, compared to like the tenement houses that were outside of that area and all, those were the ones that were burning down and all, but it's, you know, people don't think of it obviously that way at this point, but um, yeah. yeah. And then we figured out eventually that it was for money. It wasn't just like a random fire. It was right. either some camps, you know, for the insurance or, you know, um, just the means to make a few bucks. Hey, you know, tell the kids, here's a few bucks, go burn on this building. Uh-huh. You know, and, but it did become where huge areas of just nothing but burnt yep. out buildings. Um, so I, I'd go outside of my neighborhood. I don't know that a lot of my friends did, but I would. I was kind of adventurous. And so I'd walk into other neighborhoods. And I remember going up to other neighborhoods and seeing them and thinking, like, what the heck? Like, how do you live like this? Like, everything's burnt out. The stores are gone. And, you know, you have a building and then three buildings are missing. And, you know, just the chaos of it. But, you know, that's kind of how it went. And, you know, obviously I was there when, uh, Carter came by to visit and Reagan came by to visit and tried to make a big yeah. deal of it. Well, they didn't really do much of anything, but you know. Absolutely. Nice try. <laughs> <laughs> um, photo up in the South Bronx, not the thing you think of, but you know, it happened. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so by the time you're at All Hollows, had you already gotten more into heavy music or or was that later on um i started off as a kid listening to the beatles yeah be, like i said because it was the most accessible thing and it was like the thing that i first heard that was not my parents music sure so it made it easy you know to like because it was like oh there's something my parents don't have any clue what it's about you know uh-huh. <laughs> be my own little thing you know um Growing up in the 70s, I listened to the stuff on radio, but I also became a Kiss fan. Ah, so uh, okay. Big Kiss fan. Uh, saw them when they first played Master Square Garden in 77. Yeah, wow. I, I think the anniversary was just uh, yesterday, February 18th. So it was just yeah. the anniversary of when they played uh, for the first time at, at the Garden. And I was 15. I mean, my friend Pete went out and uh, got tickets. And I remember my parents, which is funny because I remember my parents kind of being like, oh, you're going to go to this concert by yourselves and you got to take the train. And I'm like, I'm in high school. I take the train now. What are you talking about? So they were like, all right, well, you know, enjoy. Because <laughs> they're kind of like, I don't know if you should be going. You're 15. And I'm like, I was 13 taking the train to go to high school. And you're worried about me t- taking the train at 15? Like, what are we talking about? So it was like, all right, you win, you know? So um, that was my first taste of like, heavier harder music it wasn't heavy metal but yeah sure but definitely that time definitely uh, harder um in about a year right around that time 77 i started listening to fm radio okay yeah i discovered fm radio i don't know what button i pressed but i was like <laughs> hey stuff and that brought on sabbath led zeppelin uh you know it just opened the floodgates to music that i would have never heard if I continue listening to like what everybody else that I grew up with listened to was, you know, probably uh, ABC or whatever was the uh, AM station that was most listened to. Um, my station was PLJ. Ah, okay, okay. And I listened to it all the time. And then they did album sides, so I got to hear an entire side of an album that I never would have bought. And wow. I was like, wow, well, so if I like side one, I probably like side two, so let's go out and get that album. And, you know, that was that was a a big thing what are some of the first like um you know harder heavier albums that you that you yourself bought if you remember um i think the arsenic stuff started because my brother got a venom album oh wow okay wow okay yeah 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 so different than anything else we'd heard and because we were kids and we didn't have a lot of money, and this is kind of crazy, we'd walk down to get albums. We didn't pay. We didn't take the train. We walked from the South Bronx to the village with enough wow. money to 
and then walk back home. <laughs> we go, you know, it's like Bleaker Bob's or something, and walk all sure. the way down, grab an album. And then because we, you know, also had it that way, we made a deal of we would get separate albums. So if I liked the new Boston album, so do you. We're not going to own two copies of the same album. Sure. You know, so if I bought, you know, the new Boston album, you're getting Frampton. If I bought, yeah. you know, what uh, we did and built up a collection where we could always have new music. Yeah. And it was dirt cheap back then. It was probably like four bucks for an album or something. So, you know, we scrape up whatever little bit of money and then walk down there. And once in a while, we got lucky and had an extra buck or two and get, a, you know, a slice of pizza and a soda and then walk our sorry asses all the way back. <laughs> you know, our album underneath our arm. Um, but that's the beginning of you know, expanding all the different stuff we could get because there was a lot of stuff we didn't know anything about. Yeah. You just bought it by the album cover. I saw the album cover. It was, wow, that looks crazy. You know, let's get that. Yeah. And I think, like, that's a purchase like that. Motorhead was probably a purchase like that. You know, you look at the album cover, you go, ah, this looks this looks top. You know, let's get that. Uh -huh. um, but that's kind of how we started to expand into heavier things until tape trading came. Uh, I see. I see. Um, the tape trading came is when we started the push with Arsenic and met a lot of people from other bands because they were all doing the same thing, making demos and just sending them out, you know, charge a few bucks for postage or whatever, but I don't think we ever made any. It wasn't like you're making money off it. You sure. charge it able to stick it in an envelope with 15 stamps on it and send it out to them. <laughs> and so I do not x-ray music cassette enclosed. <laughs> you got to have that. <laughs> you get a blank when you, you know, open up your envelope. Um, so when, when you were starting to get into, you know, Kiss and Zeppelin and Sabbath and all, uh, what did your parents think of, this kind of music, uh, were they suspicious at all of it? Uh, were they worried about you? Not really. We just kind of hung out in our rooms and listened to our stuff. And they never really, they didn't really push or pull either way. They were always kind of fairly about stuff. And um, just a lot of situations that were funny like that, that they were just kind of like left it up to us. I mean, even like I said, even high school, I remember sitting down with my parents and going, look, I got all these schools. What are you thinking? And my father being kind of like, Whichever one you like is fine. And it's like, yeah, I'm coming to you. I'm asking, you know, what do you think? And he's just like, yeah, it's kind of your deal. So I was like, okay, get it. But it was always kind of like that. They were always kind of like that with us. So yeah. a lot of things, it was always kind of like, oh, that's your thing. And, you know, and believe me, we played loud. <laughs> it, it was, I mean, you just shook the walls, you're loud. And when I first got a guitar, same thing. I got an amp. And I would put the amp on top of the bureau and crank it. And like, you know, the wall shrugged. I'm sure the neighbor, you know, the neighbors would bang on the wall. Um, I came across on Facebook with one of my old neighbors and I apologized to her for all the years of just making <laughs> so much racket in the mm. room. They could mm. hear it. Because I remember wow. them all like, what the hell, man? And we didn't care. And my parents mm. didn't. But so it was like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> wow uh what floor did you all live on by the way turn it down no no they were like turn it up to 11 <laughs> <laughs> wow um wow what how old were you when you got your first guitar and amp i was a teenager probably 12 13 oh okay 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 and do you remember where you or your your family got it from was it a music store nearby pawn shop ah it was a, a Tysco, and we got it at a pawn shop. And I still have it. It's in the basement somewhere. Oh, okay. What kind of guitar is it? It's a Tysco. Oh, okay. You said it's a Tysco. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, I see. Japanese. It looks like a tulip shape. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It works. Uh, it's, it sounds like, you know, it sounds like a train coming off the tracks. Yeah. But it works. Yeah, one giant magnetic pickup that, you know, it, it is. It's noisy as hell. <laughs> uh, it, it you know it's not meant to play i would cut your hands open on it it's got sharp parts that don't make sense that you know <laughs> the bridge something that you know it's just from another from another time 
<laughs> what do you remember some of the first things that you learned on guitar nothing self-taught i learned nothing played whatever i wanted oh okay okay so what what are some songs that you um that you started playing you know when you were learning to play guitar then uh i didn't i had no way to learn like off of anybody or so it was just noodling around with it trying to figure out I see. How do it could sound like whatever else I heard someone else play? I see, I see, I see, I see. And still kind of play that way, which is the funny thing. I never really learned how to play. I don't use a pick. I use my finger. It's I it's its own separate weird thing that I developed as a kid that I still badly do today. <laughs> <laughs> but it I think I, to me, the way it works is if I can get the ideas out of my head to come out the way I kind of want them to, then it's working. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Kind of musical skill when it comes to that. I have an ear for it. I know what it should sound like, sure, and where it should go, and I know you know how to get what I want out of it. But that's about it. I couldn't tell you. Even today, like when I write stuff, it's just an idea in my head. And then I got to piece it together and I start recording bits and pieces and get it to work. And then if you ask me to play it again for you, I'd be like, oh, well, I don't know how because I never rehearsed it. I never played it again. It's just I got it to where I got it and I recorded it. And I know certain parts, but I can't play the whole thing because it it, it didn't work that way. I never re I never practiced it. It, it wasn't sure. like that. From here to here to here. Okay, done. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, did you start playing with other kids from the neighborhood, uh, you know, after you got the guitar? No, no. I played mostly at home, uh, just by myself. And uh, then me and my brother, when my brother, you know, came along and he was a little bit older, We'd, we'd play stuff and uh, just kind of write our own goofy songs that, you know, were they were goofy. Uh, just write our own little goofy songs and things like that. We never did covers because we were terrible. Would If I did a cover, you wouldn't know what song it was anyhow. So, <laughs> like, is that a new one? I'd be like, no, that's is that what happened. Didn't you hear it? You know? <laughs> no, no covers because, Jesus, I could barely play could barely play my own material, let alone I'm going to do somebody else's stuff. <laughs> Um, and you know it was just kind of we were always kind of like drawn to music and love music and i'm sure that because of my love of music it spurred his love of music yeah. because I, every day there's not a day that i don't you know listen to something or play something or even noodle on the guitar or you know th there's there's music involved in my everyday life um so and i was like that as a kid so i'm sure that kind of pushed him in the same direction and then we started doing our own little bands that you know like i said just bad just terrible but um but fun it was supposed to be fun yeah we yeah. weren't supposed to be like the next big thing it's it was done to have fun and be creative and enjoy it and uh even by the time we got to arsenic it was that kind of thing it's it was a fun thing to do and the more louder and the more obnoxious and the faster you could play it the better because you know, that was that was the most fun you could have playing. It wasn't like, oh, I'm, you know, magnificent piece of music. No, it was like, this is just going to be loud and in your face and you're going to hate it. And the more you hate it, the more I like it. And, you know, <laughs> and I work like that. The stuff I do today, you know, the three fans I have of it is fine. Because the more you hate it, the more I enjoy it. And it's kind of like how it works out. <laughs> Um, so why don't you talk some more about your brother getting into tape trading and, and how arsenic came about and, you know, where you fit into the whole picture. Cause if I remember right, you didn't join right away. It was like a little later on. Is that right? Or. Yeah, I wasn't part of arsenic. That was my brother's thing. He started with yeah. a friend and it was literally done. I think in the bedroom, it didn't even have drums. It was. Uh, a cardboard box um, and I believe they used a bag with spoons <laughs> and you couldn't tell because it was recorded so the funny thing is the original recordings that he did were recorded on this really old tape player that made everything sound distorted which was uh... perfect he's playing out of tune super distorted 
you, you have no real drums. He's, you know, screaming in death metal voice. So it is the most distorted, crazy thing. And people, you know, people are right to him. Like, I love it. You know, whatever. And I'm going, you love it. And this kid's like 14. What are you talking about? You love it. Like, what the hell? So, you know, and it was funny that that's kind of how we started off. And then uh, we would rope in our friends because we didn't have anybody who really played instruments or liked that kind of music. So we yeah. trick our friends into joining and uh, being part of our mayhem to uh, record stuff because we had no band members and I didn't know anybody who played instruments to yeah. say like, you know, this guy plays bass or this guy plays drums or, you know, whatever. We didn't have that knowledge. We were very insular. So it was just kind of like, Hey, you want to come over and record today? Be like, yeah, let's go. And we go and just record. And it was just like, what the hell noise is this? But, um, so that's how he started. Arsenic. He was a teenager. He was a kid. And the only reason I ended up joining was, he had no other members. It was like him and his friend Junior, who's the drummer. And I said, well, I'll play bass for you. Yeah. And he's like, can you play bass? And I go, oh, I don't know. I've never played bass. <laughs> so did you go a, out and get a bass then? Yes, I had to go out and buy a bass. So I got out and got a <laughs> bass you could get. Because I wasn't going to spend my money on, you know, I don't even know if I could do it. Um, I got like a cheap bass. And uh, started playing with him, and did it for uh, for a number of years. Yeah, but it was fun. Um, it was much fun. It, you know, we didn't think like, oh, you know, we're gonna get signed, and we're gonna, you know, we knew other bands were getting signed, and we knew we weren't that far off, but we didn't have any real musician. We didn't have money. We didn't have like rehearsal was kind of like piecing it together to go to rehearsal. Nobody really had money. We didn't have people who played with us who enjoyed that kind of music. They did it because they wanted to be in a band. Yeah. But if you would have told them, like, you know, be a Metallica instead, they would have been like, oh, hells yeah, you know, <laughs> or, you know, whatever. It, it was, it was, you know, um, and oddly enough, when we started, there was no Metallica. Metallica was starting out. Uh, Slayer was starting out. Like, those bands that became big bands were either not signed yet or just getting signed. Wow, wow. Yeah, because Arsenic started, what was it? Eight, was it 83 or 84? 84. 84, yep. Yeah. Wow. So those albums wow. are starting to come out. There wasn't a great deal of that kind of metal available. That was yeah. all really, uh, it was early 80s, and that, all that stuff was, you know, pretty much new music. Um, so we didn't even think, like, covers, because it was, like, covers of what? Covers of who? Like. Who are we covering? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then I was like, I can't play that anyway. So why would I even like, you know, I'm not doing a cover of this. Like, you know, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> um, you know? so so you you mentioned you mentioned Venom already as, you know, being one of the albums that intrigued you and your brother at that period of time. What are some of the other metal albums, you know, before it, you know, Metallica, Slayer, any of them, but some of the other um metal or hard rock albums that uh interested you all we'd heard of obviously we've heard of uh merciful fate at the time yeah uh healthy frost um just a lot of stuff like that um we listened to a lot of underground stuff that was on tape that we liked uh early possessed possessed was a big one um they didn't actually come out with an album until after but we knew them through tape trading from listening to early stuff um, so that was a big thing. My brothers, uh, aim to, uh, kind of emulate possessed early on was yeah. part, of it, um, because that was a big deal. Um, my brother's singing style is similar. So that was a big push for him, uh, when it came to doing arsenic, uh, again, uh, a lot of the early arsenic stuff I was not familiar with because it wasn't anything to do with me. It wasn't my, my thing. That was my brother's thing. And, uh, and even at that point I was like, when the hell did you come up with like wanting to do death metal, like death metal of all things, like, you know, we're in an area where hip hop is born. Like what, what, what you know, nobody here likes death metal. We're not going to be able to get anybody to play <laughs> us, you know? <laughs> So it was difficult to get anybody on board to, 
join in or they could join and then realize I don't like doing this. Or, you know, as one of my oh, the old guitar players be like, why do you have to growl on all the songs? And he's like, well, if I don't, then I'm just singing and, you know, and the growling was good. I don't know about the singing, but the growling was good. So, <laughs> you know, it had to make sense to what we were doing, but it was fun. That was the key thing. The key thing of it is you could be so loud. It's almost, it almost, you know, bordered on, uh, on punk. Yeah, sure. Uh, fast as heavy as you could sound um and just that whole push of like that energy that you could provide you know doing it was just such a rush and such a fun thing to do and the songs are all right um the quality of everything recorded was terrible uh you know for the most part we didn't have money uh we didn't grow up you know like some of the other kids that were in bands, their parents had like a garage or a place they could yeah. rehearse at. We lived in the projects. So rehearsal was few and far between unless we came up with money to go to a rehearsal studio, which we didn't do for many years until I think at one point I told my brother, so we've outlived trying to make this work out of our bedroom. Yeah. We're going to go to rehearsal studios because we're, we're at a point we're not going to get any, we're not going to improve. Yeah, sure. Like, and we're not going to get anybody who wants to join in doing it like this. So that's when we started um, renting out rehearsal studios um, to go off. But again, money was tight. I'm older, so I had a job, but they didn't work. They were high school students. <laughs> so, it, you know, it was just like, when can we do this? You know, and I also, again, for myself, I played a lot of sports. So yeah. I was in. I was playing in the football league. I was playing in the softball league. I was, you know, I ran track in high school. I, you know, I was always involved in some kind of sports on top of it. So I didn't have a great deal of time. And sometimes I go from one practice to the other practice. You know, I, I see. take my base back home. I got baseball practice after band practice or the founder, you know. So, um, but it also became, it, it also was because I was, older even like you know the jimmy stories of us hanging out in my place i had a place because i'm older than him i'm a couple of years older uh -huh. so young still living at home i had my own place i see i see so why don't you talk some about um i think this might apply more to your brother but you know it'd be interesting to hear uh your own memories of it too the the style of dress that your brother especially adopted and you know, that uh, uh, he was trying to get, I guess, arsenic, you know, to cultivate as well. But the the style of dress and, you know, I, I think you have some funny stories around around metal clothing in general. <laughs> you mean like their pants that were, you know, so so he started wearing some kind of leather, leather pants of some kind. And I just look, I'm like, what the hell? You know, uh, and, you know and, it, and it's funny because I was like the most non-metal guy. Um <laughs> I always try to grow my hair out long, but as you can see, it's fuzzy. So yeah. it would be and fuzzy. And my parents would constantly give me shit over it. Like, you got to cut your hair. When are you going to cut your hair? Like, look at it. It's a mess. When you, you know. So they would constantly be on my ass to cut my hair. So then I'd cut yeah. my hair, which made me look even less metal than before. Um, but my brother was all, all about it. You know, he was all about it with the, you know, strange shirts and uh just the uh the leather pants and uh so um the funniest story of my brother which i think we spoke before was my brother had a fake judas priest shirt and it was a chinese knockoff shirt that we got in the village and it said judas priest and it was a blue shirt with a lady on the rack being stretched out and uh and she's naked on the rack and so my parents were oblivious to half of this. They didn't pay attention to this stuff. But my father came one time and had a bad cold and decided to, he didn't want to ruin one of his shirts, so he decided to wear my brother's shirt while he lathered himself up in Vicks. And uh, we come around the bend and he's wearing the Judas Priest shirt with the lady who's naked on the rack. And we're looking at each other like, did he not see this? Like, what the hell? But well, we're laughing hysterically because he's wearing it like, yeah, yeah, I'm just getting over this cold. I'll be fine, whatever. I borrowed one of your... <laughs> and I'm like, all right. 
<laughs> really? You borrowed one of your shirts? Did you look at it? Like, no, just didn't pay it no mind. And we're just laughing hysterically because it's like, it's like, what the hell, man? This is this naked lady. Fun. She's like at the, you know, stretched out the rack, you know. Mm-hmm. And and even funnier because my parents were very religious, so it makes it even more hysterical because they <laughs> every Sunday religious family, and we're like the weird heathens. Uh, just, <laughs> It's hysterical. Mm-hmm. And then, because um, I was a dick, just to piss, we had a guitar player who, first of all, he said, um, do you have to wear glasses? And I told him, only if I want to see. Yeah. So, <laughs> you're right, I look way cooler without the glasses, but then I can't see shit. So, yeah. when it became that, um, I started wearing Duran Duran shirts to band practice. I, I just, like, I just did it at, at that point just to be a jerk. And yeah, it was sure. like down and show up in the most like non metal clothing I could find and buy and go and go out and be like, oh, there is a nice whatever shirt. And I'd wear that to practice. And they look at me like, the fuck, dude? And I was like, what? <laughs> dude, really? I'm like, oh, dad, it's a t shirt. Nobody cares. So, <laughs> yeah. and, and I, I forget, John, was it you who told me? It might have been someone else that your mom would make you and your brother like parachute pants, like new wave. No, kind of so, stuff. Uh, um, when New Wave came out, um, we saw the police and they had striped shirts and they were rugby shirts, but we oh, didn't know what rugby right. So we just see them like, oh, those are pretty cool, you know, striped shirts and they got the parachute pants, whatever. So we're trying to figure out a way to get those for ourselves. Why we wanted to dress like that, I don't know. I just think because it was so, again, you're in the South Bronx, right? And we already stand out and we're already kind of misfits. So at that point, we don't care. We stand out even more. Um, so the funny thing is like, okay, hey, those that looks pretty cool, but I can't find it. So we convince our mom to make us our own striped shirts. That's right. <laughs> Which, you know, God bless her. She made the striped shirts for us. And then we're walking around looking like, you know, bad, you know, jailbreak, where's Waldo? I don't know. You know, I don't know what the look's supposed to be, but it was terrible. <laughs> and, you know, we, we dress like that. We dressed like that. We had, I think my brother had a shirt that had like almost like fake leopards. Yeah, you know, just bad. Just bad. Yeah. But we, didn't, we didn't care. Um, and that was a big part of it. A big part of it was not necessarily about how talented you were or anything like that. It's how ballsy are you? Yep. You know, like if you're ballsy enough to do this and make this music that nobody wants to hear and then dress like you belong in another time zone it's kind of all right i I get it you know you guys are out there you know (laughs) there weren't many but jimmy was one jimmy was one and that was you know and we're fellow virgos and you know it it, immediately we clicked it was like i get it i get what you're doing like you're not gonna conform i get it and that's cool because we don't conform and we don't care who likes it or doesn't like it or you know, whatever, you know, music we do, whatever, we're doing it because we enjoy it. It didn't matter if anybody else liked it. That wasn't ever the point. And we weren't, it wasn't like, you know, if we had some great musical chops and we were doing it, then you go, you know, you're kind of wasting your time. You know, you could play X, Y, Z while you're playing this. Yeah. Burnt, the attitude was very punk. It was like, you know, let's just be heavy. Let's just be loud. Let's be fast. Let's be obnoxious. Let's, you know, let's ruffle feathers. Let's, you know, and that was it. That was a big uh, part of it. Did, um, ha- has Henry shared with you before? I'll ask him this too, of course, but how, how did he come up with the name Arsenic? I don't know. Okay. I'll ask him when, when, when we talk. Uh, uh, and what are some other of the early tape trading bands that he came into contact with you mentioned possessed of course um but i know he 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 like traveled even and and yeah i know there's some more stories around tape trading too that yeah we had a uh we had an early copy of the first exodus album wow. and that was a big thing that went around so much so that when the album came out everybody knew it by the time the album actually came out people who were in the scene who liked them yeah. knew it album already because it had been on tape and purchased and and traded and you know so much already um it was funny seeing the beginning of megadeth yeah 
because Metallica had just gotten signed and Dave was out and then he started Megadeth and he actually came out to Lemoore's and we saw him there. So we got uh, to early shows of bands, you know, um, like that. Um, my brother um, was in touch with Chuck from Death and at one point when he went to Florida on vacation, met up with him and hung out with him for a few hours. So, you know, it was just things like that. We were all kind of in the same boat. Um, my brother was also friends with Gil Joy from Necrophagia. And when he was in touch with him at first, I believe Killjoy was a teenager. I want yeah. to say he was 14 or 15 years old. He was a kid. And he was talking to my brother like, hey, I'm thinking about starting a band. What do you think? And he's like, oh, yeah, just go for it. You know, that kind of thing. Because he was kind of like, you know, I want to do stuff like this. And I don't know. And, you know, because he was a teenager. And because we were teenagers, well, my brother was basically at that point. Uh, he kind of talked to him like, yeah, just do it. And, and if people don't like it, who cares? Just, you know, go ahead and do it, whatever. And he always remembered that. And he always, you know, mentioned us on albums and the, you know, thank you uh, section or whatever. And uh, even when the Seeds of Darkness CD came out, he's the one that put it through, um, which, you know, again, it was surreal because the sound quality is terrible. It's, you know, it's not even a garage. It's it's, it's recorded under a garage, it's, you know, <laughs> but, it, but it's what it was for the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a tape demo from the early 80s. So, I mean, it's not going to sound you know, polished and, and anything like that. And by the time I left, they had started to go into more proper studios. The one recording I did um, was live to two track. So uh, all the I see. recordings were live. They were just recorded straight onto tape. And then later on, they went into a studio. But when we went and did the live two track, even with the guy who was the engineer, um, he had never recorded any kind of metal wow so he's like trying to mix it and we're like oh no you're making it like too soft and too what no it's supposed to be louder and more you know so it was that kind of thing where you know if we would have gotten lucky and gotten somebody who was into it it would have been like oh i know exactly what to do this is the way to mic it this is the amp you should use this is but we didn't we got a guy who was just kind of like you know and we're doing it on the cheap so we're showing up at you know two o'clock in the morning to record it uh -huh. you know so all of that, wow. but it was still like a fun experience to go through and be able to do that. And even to have a couple of people who up and coming at that point in the scene kind of knew who we were. Yeah. yeah. You know, we were a lot of fanzines and things like that. And uh, a lot of the tape trading and things like that. Um, we never thought it was that kind of thing. Um, sure would have been nice to get signed and we had an opportunity to sign with somebody i don't remember who it was my brother might remember better um but we had to come up with the money ah, was, i see had to come up with the initial money to record and we didn't have money. yeah <laughs> yeah we, um, it was, what what was the what was the recording that you were on souls like screaming hallucinations i forget i was on beneath the grave and souls like screaming Ah, beneath the grave and souls light screaming. Okay, okay, and uh, and both of those were recorded in the the live two track method. Uh, souls was live two track. Beneath the grave was in a rehearsal studio. I see, I see, I see. Um, and so live 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 two track, I guess, is the most uh uh complex <laughs> complex recording method that you all use. Is that right? Well, at that point, because he did hallucination yeah. uh, later on in a real studio. I see. Yeah, that's the only one that was recorded in a right. real studio. I see. I see. And I, I see. wrote some with him for that because I didn't write a lot of stuff. It was mostly his deal. Yeah. Um, but by then, I was already not in the band. I had moved to Boston. I see. And I see. I see. And you were. You were a lot older than I guess significantly older yeah. than the rest of the guys anyway right so he was still you know he was still like in his 20s he was like 22 23 years old I'm 26 27 you know so I was yeah. already out and about and I wanted to get a house and uh couldn't afford anything in New York and 
ended up moving out to Boston. Well, suburb of Boston. I see. Um, so do you want to talk some about the different members in Arsenic? I mean, you know, obviously you weren't um, a part of the band for the whole time and all, but all of the different members that you remember, I mean, you and your brother were the constants, but some of the other people who were in Arsenic over the years. Um, first drummer we had is uh, Segundo Rosario. And his father is also Segundo Rosario, so he's junior. Uh -huh, so all... Junior, yeah. Um, he was the only person we could find who could do blast beats. Ah, wow. And they're, they're hard. I mean, it's a hard thing to do. And <laughs> no one who could do blast beats at the time. So that's how we started off with him. Um, before I joined, it was him, uh, my brother's friend, uh, Jeff Gonzalez, uh, who ended up singing for Power Theory. Ah, that's right. That's right. You told me that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, and one of our friends, his name is Rob Cintron, who played guitar. And I met Rob. I worked at Disco Met Records. Ah, OK, OK. And, uh, he, you know, he came in and we're talking. He said he played guitar. And I was like, oh, that's cool, because we're looking to do a band and whatever. And that's how he got involved. And that's early, early Arsenic. And then all those guys left. I see. I see. But junior, and that's when I played bass on Beneath the Grave, and it was just us three. I see. I see. So did did Jeff, Junior, Rob, did, did any of those guys like death metal, or they just were playing to be a part of the band? Um, Jeff got into metal because obviously he went on, and I think he took vocal lessons and then became sure. a And he had played some drums, and he'd played some bass, um, but he became a pretty pretty good singer. Yeah, um, yeah. And, um, then uh, Junior was doing it because he could. Yeah. He was my brother's friend. So he did it because, you know, it was a way to hang out and do it and have fun doing it. And Rob, we just kind of lost track of <clears throat> along the way. And after I ended up joining, I ended up joining because it was only my brother and uh, Junior left at that point. Yeah. After that, um, there was a guy named Ray that I worked with and he played guitar. And he says, um, my buddy Mark's a drummer. And then that's how we ended up being the next version of, uh, of Arsenic. I and see. He, well, but he ended up leaving because he went off to college. Oh, okay, okay, okay. That's right, that's right. I'm trying to do it in the order that makes sense. Somewhere in between, Kamchatka came about because Junior wasn't playing drums, so we couldn't do Arsenic. We had no drummer. And we couldn't find somebody who could do that kind of drumming. Yeah. So so Jeff ended up playing drums, and we did Kamchatka. Ah, I see, I see, I see, I see. I knew Kamchatka came between the two yes, arsenics, but, that, but... Then when I met Ray at work and his buddy Mark, that's how we made arsenic come back. I see, I see, I see. Um... So you mentioned that you were involved in a, in some of the songwriting. Um, was it for Beneath the Grave or Souls Light Screaming? Maybe, maybe both. I I, I, uh, I forget. But I didn't write a lot of stuff. Mostly it was done by my brother. Mostly uh, your brother, yeah. I have one song on Hallucinations. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Song on yeah, Hallucinations. Brother-in-law Ray plays on it. I see, I see. Um, so Ray and... Urbino in law ended up playing bass on hallucinations i see along with mark and and the other ray right now he's a really good guitar player wow he's a really um, good guitar. and what uh i mean you know you talked you talked about uh the challenges playing this kind of music in your neighborhood um but what was it like you know maybe well, I guess maybe this is more for your brother because he's the one who is mainly interacting with people, you know, in the wider kind of scene uh, across the country. But I mean, you know, Cubans and Puerto Ricans from the South Bronx playing death metal. Um, how was that like received by the scene outside of the Bronx? It was it was funny because a lot of people didn't know. Yeah. And they really couldn't tell until either they met us or 
got like a good photo of us where they're like, the hell, <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, yeah, one of the reactions my brother got one time was, oh, I didn't think you'd kind of look like this, which was funny. Um, uh, it was there was somebody who got in touch with us when Junior wasn't playing with us anymore and said, um, would love to get in touch with your old drummer. We're looking for a drummer and love is playing. And we we're kind of like, they don't know what Junior looks like, do they? Because <laughs> he's a dark, dark skinned Spanish guy, you know? Um, again, not because he's a dark skinned Spanish guy, but because you don't equate that with that kind of music. So That's right. when you're thinking it's something and you get something else, it's, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and he dresses like a cab driver. You know, he, he's, he's not a metal dude at all. He wears a little scully cap and dress shirts. And yeah, he's, you know, the last guy you think is going to be the drummer that you're hearing. So, <laughs> we're, yeah, yeah, we'll give you information. And send, I think we sent them a photo being dicks. And uh, that kind of like ended it. You know, it's like, yeah, he's not going to fit. I go, no, no, none of us are going to fit in. That's, yeah. <laughs> none of us look. Yeah. In. It, you know, um, because it didn't matter. It wasn't that kind of thing. It's That's the right. thing that made a big deal about right because if you remember we went through the whole era of posers and, sure. a poser. and are you a poser and you know if you listen to this but not that you're a poser and if you wear this not that you're a poser. you know and it was nonsense yeah nonsense yeah. i can't look any more metal than i do <laughs> but if you heard it you know you'd be like wow that's pretty good what is that you know and then you go oh it's that guy and you're like come on <laughs> yeah i know i know i know completely <laughs> completely ridiculous well uh what are what's some of the other music that you were listening to, you know, beyond metal at this point in time, other music you're into? I'm into everything. Yeah. I'm into everything. Um, I've always been into everything. So I listen to New Wave, I listen to rock, I listen to metal, um, little blues, a little, like anything. Almost anything yeah. that I interesting. I was okay with a lot of stuff that people who listen to metal probably would never ever think to listen to things like uh bebop deluxe uh -huh. uh, and cope and you know teardrop explodes um just new wave stuff um almost sci-fi stuff like just things that uh didn't fit the mold sure 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 but love music so i've listened to everything metal was a big deal at that time because it was so new yeah I became so immersed into it that it was like every release and who's this person and who was this person played in this band and now it's in this band. And, you know, it almost like was fanatical because it was just new and every day was something new. And look, here's another new band. And look, here's another new you know guitar player you never heard of and a new, new, new singer. And so because of that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, because of that, uh, metal was a big deal at the time but to me it was the heyday of metal yep it's middle 80s it's the heyday of metal it's you know ufo scorpions it's you know and you could just like start listing all the maiden priests all uh -huh. the band bands that at that point were really really big yeah um, we went to see maiden and priest we went to see you know ozzy come around we went to see ufo we went to see so it was that time frame where you could find the metal show to go to all the time in New York. Yeah, yeah. I was I was going to ask you to talk more about some of the shows that you all went to at this at this moment in time. You mentioned a lot already. Um, why don't you talk some more about some of the shows that you're going to? I uh, went to see uh, Priest with Maiden. Wow. Maiden still had uh, Paul Diano in the band. And uh, that, I see, I see. Wow. That was my first show I took him to. Uh, wow. So Maiden with Priest. And it was the Worldwide Blitz Tour for uh, Priest. It's the Point of Entry album. Ah, okay, okay. What what uh, venue was that at? Pillars. Ah, wow. So we went to that. I saw Kiss at Master Square Garden in 77. Uh -huh. uh, we would catch Made in a Priest whenever they came around every year. Uh, saw Motorhead. Saw Ozzy a couple of days after Randy passed. I see. I got to do one of the shows with Bernie Torme playing wow. guitar. Um, 
So Ozzy with Jakey Lee. Uh, saw Slayer, Exodus, and Benham at Studio 54. Oh, okay. How was that show? Um, I saw Kiss with um, at the Palladium the first time they played with Eric Carr. Yeah. Wow. I was at, I was at Pat Benatar and Eddie Money. They were playing, I think it was the pier. And word went around that Kiss was playing at the Palladium. And so in the middle of Eddie Money's set, me and my buddy Pete left and went down to the Palladium, found the scalper, got tickets, and saw Kiss with Eric Carr. Wow. So, I mean, I've been to so many shows. Um, and again, living in the city at the time, you know, there was always somebody playing. Um, got to see Slayer, got to see um, Megadeth play at uh, Lemoore's. I think we saw Anthrax there. Um, just, you know, so many, so many bands. And on a given night, you can go out and find the band that you weren't even expecting to just. We had a night we were out and uh, just going through the city and Robert Palmer was playing at some little club somewhere. And wow. we went in a uh, Robert Palmer and it was just like, why not? You know, he's here. So let's go see him. And so we went to shows all the time. Wow. Wow. Um were there other bands that were, you know, playing a similar kind of metal to Arsenic in New York City that you all knew of or were close to? Not really. Yeah, that's what I thought. Not that I know of. I mean, there was a lot of rock bands, and, and I'm sure that there were bands that did some sort of metal. But when we were doing it, we didn't know of anybody else. In yeah. fact, if we could have, we would have tried to poach some members. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if it was, you know, playing any kind of metal. And especially the stuff we were doing. The stuff we were doing was so extreme. The extreme, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really um, extreme doing it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, because, I, you know, I was I was thinking in my head, and as far as time frame goes, it's hard for me. I, you know, in Yonkers, maybe. But that I'm sure that was like a world, a completely different world as far as... um. You all, I mean, I can't imagine you all went to Yonkers very much, if ever, but um, but even then it might have been just a few a few years too late. Um, but I was trying to think of, you know, other uh, early death metal bands. I don't think anybody, as, I don't think anybody yeah. In, yeah, or even remotely in our area was doing that kind of music that early. Yeah, yeah, I don't think so either. I mean, not that I can think of know that much about it yeah and like again the scene kind of broke out with the tape trading and things like that and i go okay there's other people doing it but none of them seem to be near us uh yeah California, some in texas a couple in florida but nothing like in our in our area that i could think of that i came across um at least not death metal yeah you sure know? sure sure I like anthrax yeah and, you know bands who were metal bands that played in in the new york area but not uh, the extreme stuff that we were kind of doing at that point. We didn't know a lot of people who, not only that, we didn't know people who liked it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But, um, and we could somebody to, hey, join up, this is what we're doing. Like, eh, I don't know. I don't know about this. <laughs> uh, so so what, what was the first, you know, b beyond the tape trading circles, the first, uh, I guess, uh, uh album released by um you know a, a, a record company uh death metal album that you remember seeing was it was it death or possessed or more it was angel probably possessed yeah because that was yeah. big on like from the tapes you know um that was a big deal they were yeah. just so heavy and so different and, you know, the melodic guitar parts and just all of it was just something we were not used to. So that was a big deal. Um, and they were probably one of the first really big acts to, you know, uh, them and death to to be out there where you'd be like, shit, you could buy an album from them now. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. but a lot of you, a lot of the material already because of trading tapes. Um, yeah. Even at the point of Slayer, there were multiple Slayers. 
the Slayer of the Stuck was not the only Slayer at the time. Uh-huh. Uh, it was like a San Antonio one. Um, there, there were different ones. Yeah, sure. And so that was the other thing. It was like AOL, right? You're trying to get a band name that not everybody else is going to use. So it, it wasn't easy to come up with a band name either. I don't know if that's how he came up with Arsenic or not. But uh, trying to get band names too were kind of like, you know, what are you going to call this? Yeah, because you, you want it to be intimidating and badass sounding, but there's only so many words <laughs> right. like that. <laughs> right, there's only so can use it before you're like, this is corny. What do we call it? <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, I guess, well, I'm trying to think timing wise. Had you left the band already by the time, you know, death metal started to blow up? I mean, you know, there were the couple, the couple releases, but really like 89, 90, I guess is when it started to blow up in the, in the scene. Had you already left the band by that point? The band was done at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Hallucinations was 89. Yeah. Yep. So by, by 90, uh, the band was, well done yep yeah yeah wow because you know i mean at that point my brother had his daughter which also at that point was like okay now he's got a little kid and you know it's just not easy to be like i'm gonna take time off to go rehearse my corny ass music somewhere so it's like yeah Mm -hmm. you know like (laughs) but but yeah it's interesting because you know even if even if arsenic had formed or two or three years later, um, there were just so many more options for death metal bands in the early nineties, as far as, um, you know, record companies that were interested in it at all, but y'all were definitely, uh, trailblazers in a way that, uh, uh, you know, you missed out on a lot of that, I guess. Right. Yeah. A lot of the uh, timing was just, um, Let's put it this if we were older when we started, yeah. Let's say when he's when we started, yeah, uh, and had jobs and had you know maybe uh, a different way of going about it. It would have been different, yeah, sure. Uh, but I was older, but it wasn't my thing. Arsenic was my brother's thing, yeah. So I did it to help him out, and ended up doing it for a couple of years. Uh, because I I enjoyed playing with you know doing it and recording and all that, but it was his thing, not my thing. Yeah. So, um, and he was a teenager when it started. Sure. So yeah, the timing of it, obviously. Um, but then again, maybe at that point, there's so much more talented bands out there. You don't get signed anyway, and it doesn't. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Um, it's just you know. That's right. It, You're either at the beginning of it or you better be good because now you're in the middle of it. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Um, Can't show up being Metallica when there's already a Metallica. It's like, (laughs) look, here's a band that's kind of like shitty Metallica. It's like, yeah, that's the band I want to (laughs) hear. Crappy version of Slayer. Oh, perfect. Let's let's go. (laughs) You know? Um, So... So did you did you ever see while while arsenic was together anyway? Did you ever see like possessed or death or any of you know bands playing similar kinds of music to you live or was it was only through tape trading? That was only through uh, through uh, tape trading. We didn't yeah. we didn't get to live. Yeah, um, that's what I thought. Um, yeah, and we stream bands playing in the area. Sure. Um, we lot of stuff that was really heavy like that um yeah if you went to florida you could see a lot of death metal there was yep. a ton there. uh i don't know about like a certain parts of california had it where you had like exodus would play um you know there was just a, you know or uh that kind of like death angel high rack sure. um just a ton of like really good bands from california that would play out there all the time and uh we didn't have that. Yeah. We had, you know, you got Priest, Maiden, Ten Nugent, um, Ozzy. Yeah. You know, that circuit, right? Every year, Ozzy's coming. 
Judas Priest is coming. Iron Maiden is coming. <laughs> and then they'd bring along UFO, Ted Nugent, uh, Quiet Riot, Motley Crue, Motorhead. Uh -huh. You know, but it was like kind of like the same bands that played every year. I see, I see. But and, and they were really extremely heavy bands. Yeah, sure. Um, and what, what about, did you or your brother ever venture into the hardcore scene? Um, I listened to some hardcore punk. Yeah. Um, and I got into it when I started playing bass. Ah, I, I see. That's just the connection right there of just, yeah. And ass on bass is basically hardcore punk. That's right. <laughs> so, right. so I had no idea how to play bass. I'm going to join up and help them. And I'm like, I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. I'm. I'm a shitty guitar player. Now I'm going to be an even shittier bass player. So, <laughs> um, but that's when I started listening to like DRI yeah. and DOC and uh, AOD and, uh -huh. you know, all those bands that were like the hardcore scene, uh, Cryptic Slaughter. Yeah. Just all that were out at that point doing that kind of stuff. Sure. Um, sure. And that for a while. You know, um, and, and just a lot. Of, I, I listened to a lot of stuff, a lot of different stuff that had nothing to do with metal at all. Like I said, yeah. a lot of new wave, a lot of avant garde, a lot of stuff that was very musical and had nothing metal about it. Sure. Um, but when it came to metal, I knew my shit and I loved it. And, you know, I could tell you anything about any band at any point. Not so much now. I'm older and it doesn't matter that much. Yeah, it's yeah, not, yeah. You know, I mean, it's not that kind of thing. But back then, you know, when it's like you're so eye opened into it and it's so fresh and new and you're totally immersed and it's happening while you're there, you know, it's it's like a, it's like a sports team, right? I know who this guy is and what he does and where he lives and where he grew up and how tall he is and it's like stupid facts that mean nothing. But it's like, did you know that Kerry King is five foot? You know, whatever? and it's just <laughs> not right. But you're so mm -hmm. immersed and you're such a fan that you know everything about every, you know, and they recorded it at this studio and the engineer was so-and-so and yeah, you know, that, that kind of stuff. But um, it was a big deal. Did I, I, did Arsenic ever play any live shows? No. Okay. I didn't think so. Yeah. 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 So just all the multiple demo recordings. Yeah. We had uh Kamchaka played in front of some people. Oh, okay, okay. Where was that at? Uh, in a rehearsal studio with another band. I see, I see, yeah. I see, I see. That we kind of all knew from like their friends and some of our friends, and so we actually played in front of people who had no idea who we were. I see. Who probably still today wish <laughs> they didn't know who we were. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell was that? Um, <laughs> um, and why don't you, why don't you talk some about the sound of Kamchatka? I mean, obviously they weren't the blast beats, but was it a similar kind of, similar kind of metal that you all were going for it, or different sound? Or thrash metal. More thrash. It was more faded. Um, it, I, you know, it came out about the time that, um, I'm trying to think which, if it was Among the Living from Anthrax came out. So it was like the, along those lines. I see. That I was see, the see. sound that we were going with at that point. Um, we again, you know, we were able to get what we wanted out of, you know, coaxing those instruments to come up with the sound that is in our heads. Because technically, technically, we shouldn't have been able to do any of it, you know, but. <laughs> We were like, come on, this is the sound we want. Come on, let's go. Let's make it happen. <laughs> but we poked our instruments into producing the sound that people heard later on. It, uh, it, it, it worked. I mean, that's all that matters. <laughs> and I, I still work that way. The stuff I do now is still done that way. It's yeah. idea in my head. And, uh, and the funny thing is I could have no ideas for like the longest. I can go six months with not one idea at all and one day i wake up and i have it and then the steam rolls and before you know it i got 10 songs out of it 
and it just wow. gels like one after the other after the other and i'm trying to get it down before i forget it and i'm jotting things down and i'm you know running in the other room and recording a bit so i don't forget it and taking out my phone and recording a part so i don't forget it and all of a sudden i have you know 10 songs 12 songs wow <laughs> but wow. Comes, it, you know it's, i work almost like uh like a soundtrack yeah yeah and so usually start to end it's not like i came up with the third song i came up with the first song and that was the second one and the third and the fourth and and, and so on um but that's how i operate when it becomes you know the time that i'm thinking of recording something sure and um that's that's how i've always done it i don't um, have any skill when i could tell you like this is what i'm playing or what note what key or what, i can't tell you any of that i can tell you that it's here and yeah. oh and it should sound like this and this should go here and i should add this here and it just kind of works its way that way so why don't you talk some more about um i mean i know this is obviously more henry's thing anyway but what all was involved in tape trading obviously there's the actual trading of the tapes but um but you know you talk about like zines phone calls because it involved you know all of that also and if you were involved in it you can talk about your own involvement or you can just talk what you saw henry's involvement yeah i was. did same trading as well it started with fanzines so when we'd go to bleaker bobs and look at albums and stuff they always had fanzines and um they weren't expensive they were like a buck or something and i think a lot of stuff was just done on consignment yeah and so fanzine and whatever and then you'd write to the if you wanted your tape reviewed you'd send them a copy of your tape and write to the fanzine and say hey i'm so and so from arsenic and you you know and my brother usually did that he's the one that would write to them like i'm henry from arsenic and here's our latest demo you know let us know what you think and you do a review and sometimes fanzines would contact us and be like hey send me your latest demo because we want to do a review or we want to do a story or you know whatever the case um there's a bunch of reviews. I think Blackthorn Magazine was one. I mean, we have a bunch of reviews. I have them somewhere. They're in yeah. a folder. Um, and some are hysterical. Uh, there was one that was from a, I think it was Japanese fanzine. And just the description of the music and the stuff we're doing is hysterical. It's just... Oh, really? It's just like, it's the funniest thing. Because it's like, first they don't put Henry, they put Henley. And then they put, <laughs> next they put John's brother, perhaps, and question marks. And I'm like, dude, we have the same name. Like, well, you know, whatever. So uh, he describes the bass playing as me handling the four-string toy. Um, <laughs> he says, Henley's vocals are killing it all over the place. I'm like, what does that mean? You know, so, so always funny stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> But that's the tape trading star like that from fanzines. And um, if you saw something that seemed interesting, you send them the two bucks and all of a sudden you get a tape. And then somebody else said, hey, if I got this tape, I'll trade you this tape. So then, you know, we had a double deck cassette thing and we'd make tapes for people and constantly just, you send me one, I send you one. Sometimes I buy one. Sometimes they want one of ours for a review or, or something like that. And... Um, you also had, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Intense Mutilation. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, Mutilation was around at the same time. They became friends with my brother. I think they have a song called Old, Ode to Henry. Um, oh. One of their and that's the song that's about Henry. And they, uh, over the phone, got him to sing one of the lines or something in the song. It's just, you know, that whole thing. But, um, but they were a big deal in, in, in the city. And people knew who they were, and uh, they were also involved in a lot of the stuff with tapes at the time. And uh, yeah, just it, we we all did it, and it was how you got new music, you Absolutely. know. And good, and some of it was really funny because it wasn't very good, but it didn't matter. We weren't critique like we weren't like these guys suck. It wasn't that kind of thing. It was like. Oh man, this guy, have you heard this? You know, and we put it on and be like, oh, what the hell are they doing? You know, whatever. Or be like, wow, that's really good, you know? Yeah. Um, and it went beyond, like, at some point we had, I remember having, uh, I think it was a cassette for the band uh, Anvil Chorus. And uh, it was just 
phenomenal. We were like, this is great. Why isn't this being released? And I yeah. think it eventually out. But um, for years, we were like, why is nobody putting this out? This is like fantastic. And they were very technical. I think the guys ended up being in Heathen or something later on. I don't remember all the facts right now. But um, it was just that kind of stuff that you could get. You can get the most crudest, you know, demo somebody recorded in their bathroom to like this thing that sounded like it's an album. Like, what the hell? So, yeah. yeah, we went through that for many years. It just kind of dried up after a while. Sure. Uh, late 80s, when a lot of bands got signed, it kind of killed off. I'm sure they still did it, but it kind of killed it off. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and um, going from that to CDs, because now it wasn't tapes. Tapes were so antiquated. Yep, that's right. You went from a cassette tape Walkman to a portable CD player or something. And so even technology kind of did away with uh, with that. And I know your I know your brother at least racked up some considerable uh, phone bills while he was Absolutely. involved in all of this, right? Absolutely. He would call him and Killjoy would end up talking on the phone for hours. And Killjoy was in Ohio. And so it was back when, we're in, you know, uh, long distance calls were long distance calls and they were super expensive. And I just remember my brother being on the phone for hours and my father coming in the room like, Henry, please get off the phone, you know, and it was just kind of like that whole thing. And I'm thinking, yeah, get the hell off the phone. It's like, you know, $50 phone call, like, you know, back then, you know, because yeah. the, the would show up and instead of it being like $30, it'd be like a hundred something dollars. And it'd be like... <laughs> did you make all these calls? And he's like, yeah, I was talking to this guy from this band and this guy from this band. And I'm going, you're ballsy as hell, man. <laughs> At the end of money and you just dropped a $110 like phone bill on them. Like what the hell? But yeah. it, you know, it was the times, you know, yeah. and their, you know, families or whatever did the same shit on their end was like, who the hell are you talking to in New York city that you spent, <laughs> you know, dollars on the phone, like talking shit about, you know, what band you like? Get the hell out of here, you know? Because <laughs> teenagers is like, I really like this band. I think this band should go out and get so and so. Oh, you know what'd be great if they released that live album. I heard that live album. It wasn't that good. And you go, fuck, that's an hour. That's an hour of that nonsense. And it's like, you know, hundred <laughs> bucks. <laughs> hundred bucks a day sucks, but a hundred bucks in in, in nineteen eighty four. It was a thousand bucks, you know? <laughs> For real. For real. <laughs> I'd be like, Man. you know? Wow. We had, uh, we had the super long cord on the phone. So if somebody came to the door, you could still like be on the phone and go all the way to the front door and answer the door. I'd be like, yeah, I'm on the phone now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um... Yeah, but he did it all the time. He did it all the time. And he'd call and talk to people all over the place. And I was just like, dude, what are you doing? Oh, this is going <laughs> this band. He's in California. I'd be like, dude, that's going to cost a bajillion dollars. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you know? And my dad would come in like, you're killing me. He'd literally say, you're killing me. Can you get off the phone? You're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. It was. You get the itemized phone list with all the calls and, you know, the billions of dollars, you know, $13 or 10 minutes on the phone, you know, with somebody in Ontario or some shit. And you'd be like, what the hell bill is this? Because <laughs> you know, the entire phone bill used to be like 35 bucks. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then all of a sudden he'd get like 110, 150, you know, it's like, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. And oh, it's like, <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, so after Arsenic, uh, you know, is no more. Um, and but before you you start God Shroud in 2012, were you playing in other bands, um, you know, like in the 90s, 2000s? No, I ended up recording some stuff um, with different band names that were a uh, different kind of music. It was, it was still kind of metal based, but um, maybe more progressive or just different style uh, of music. Not so much like the early stuff I did. Yeah. Um, 
And I have a couple of projects, which I don't even think of. I don't even, you know, it's not that kind of thing. It's, um, it was a way that I kind of learned through trial and error how to record on my own. I see. I record these at home. So, um, Exmoro was one of them. And I did something called Spiral Downer. Um, and they're, again, they're different kinds of music, but it let me hone my skill as to the recording process. I was very green. I had no idea what I was doing, but I was determined to do it. So I started recording stuff and making these little albums and, uh, uh, very different, very different from the stuff I do so much so that I stopped doing it. I did yeah. it for a while. Eh, it's all right. But once I kind of really learned my way around the recording process um, is when I got in touch with Henry and said, uh, we should do something. We should do something. Because that was the fun part of us working on music together that I missed. Yeah. So that was 2012. And I said, uh, I'm thinking of doing this thing called God Shroud. And I'd like for you to be involved. And the way I'll do it is I'll come up with all the music. I'll send it to you. And then you come up with the lyrics. And then you come down and sing your parts. And he was like, that's, you know, we didn't work on it together. We worked on it together separately. Yeah. And so the, my reasoning for doing it that way was um, because we weren't doing it with each other's inputs, I realized that the stuff I had done without him sounded totally different than the ideas he came up with and the stuff he came in with. So it sounded totally different than what I would have done. Yeah, so like sure. I had my version of it and he did it and it's a completely different song. Yeah. Even music, it's a totally different song, goes in a totally different direction, totally different sound to it, you know? And that's kind of what made it interesting of like piecing like your half and my half, you know? Um, and we did, the only reason we stopped doing it was the pandemic. After the pandemic, when he didn't really come around and I didn't want to wait several years to not record, I, I just kept doing it by myself. Yeah. And, but yeah, no, but that's how we ended up, start, you know, how we ended up starting that because it was a fun way for us to, again, interact and share ideas and be like, hey, I got an idea for this and I got an idea for that. And kind of like as we did when we were kids and we'd sit there and be like, let's work out some songs. Absolutely. Uh, and what what are, what are some of the guiding, um, I guess, sounds or, or themes behind God Shroud? Um, at first, it was going to be Doom. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the, the initial thought was to be along the lines of like Black Sabbath. Yeah, sure. Um, but I didn't want to sound exactly like it. I mean, there's so many bands that are out there that do that. And, yeah. and just, you know, there, there's a ton of them. There's a ton of them that just go out and uh, sound like that. And just stoner music stuff that just is just overdone. It's over and over. And it's like, okay, how many more of these do you want to hear? Yeah. Um, so that was the initial thought. And then it kind of like just became something a little bit um, left of that, you yeah, know. Sure. It, the, the same mindset, but I wanted to switch it up where every recording would sound a little bit different than the one before. So yeah. if you ever get a chance and go through it, you would hear that they all they're the same, but they all sound kind of different. I even purposely recorded them with different guitars. To make them, have oh, I didn't realize that. Other as well, um, and just different ideas. It, it was you know depending on you know whatever. Um, and, and one of the funniest things is because I have to come up with a way of remembering what I'm doing music wise. I come up with the song titles, and I send it to him, and he's like, "It's really hard for me just not writing it, but now I got to write it with your song title." And it, <laughs> Well, that's the only way I'm going to remember them because if not, I'm just going to send you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, you know. So because he had said that, 
Um, at one point, I sent them one that said seven. <laughs> seven song. And so he writes the song out, and he sends it back to me. And it says seven. And in the lyrics, it's seven. I go, no, it's the song's not seven. It's the seventh song. So now we're laughing because I go, you told me not to give you the title. So I sent you the seventh song I'm working on, and you write a song about seven. <laughs> you know, I go, I like it. So that's fine, you know. Um, but it's just that that whole that whole thing of um generally it's dark. I write very dark, even though I am not a dark person at all. But yeah, I write yeah. always very kind of like that doomy aspect to it. Um but it's the style of how it comes out of it's not done on purpose. Um, sure. you know, um and it's always more fun. It's always more fun. A horror movie is always more fun than, you know, a sunshine happy movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. And has Puppy. has Henry has Henry like started playing or I mean contributing again after the pandemic? Have you all got to that point yet? <clears throat> no, I ended up doing it by myself. The last one now, I was going to have him do uh lyrics for me. Yeah. Um, so he sent me lyrics and I couldn't get them to work and he goes oh they fit in perfectly but again he hears it different than i do so he sends it to me and i'm trying to sing the lyrics and i can't get it to fit and i'm going when the hell am i supposed to come in like this doesn't this doesn't work so i go back and i go this doesn't work he goes what are you talking about it's perfect and i go jesus i go i can't get your lyrics to fit. i say you know what your lyrics are too good for me <laughs> I'm going to use my shitty lyrics that I know I can sing. I go, you keep, your lyrics are too fancy for me. So the end result. Um, yeah, I'd like to be able to have them come back to it and and, uh, and do it again. It's been a while. I think I've done three without them now. Yeah. So Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. It's been a while. But um, yeah, it's always fun to have them do it. It's just, uh, it's just not always easy. It, it sure. takes... I, I have him come up, and then he's literally got to sing everything within a day. Yeah, that's a lot. Or it, and then he has to, and that's if it comes out right, because if it doesn't come out right, and I got to play around with it, um, you know. So usually he sings everything, and then I go over it and make sure it fits in, and that the levels are right, and fix whatever or don't fix what you know, depending on how it comes out. But it's a difficult way to do it because i usually only get them for a day yeah and is all the recording for godshot has all of that taken place at your home studio you can call it a home studio it's yeah, uh hey yeah uh, <laughs> it's equipment in my bedroom yes equipment uh, in your bedroom hey that's 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 all you need <laughs> and and the last couple were done at this house i see i see i see in my bedroom very primitive with just microphones sticking out all over the place and uh sure and basically live i don't use anything fancy i record out of a small practice amp i see i see i see i go through a board where they add all kinds i don't add all kinds of distortion or effects or things like that i do yeah. all that manually and i record out of a very small uh roland cube amp wow uh, I don't use, like I said, I just use the gain on it. And uh, just the way I do it, I think it sounds, uh, for me, at least for my hearing of it, it sounds the way I want it to sound. Sure. I don't like oversaturated. I mean, I know that that was a big thing where people would oversaturate the distortion where it just became a blur. And I like the way mine comes out. Yeah. It's a little bit more defined. Um and a little, you know, easier to kind of control. Absolutely. Um, so I I have uh, at least one more question about arsenic, going back to that for a second. Um, and then we can, you know, touch on some other things as well. But uh, as far as uh, the sound of arsenic goes, was there anything um, that, you would say or that you viewed as kind of uh 
reflective of, you know, the South Bronx in the sound of arsenic. Um, you know, it could be lyrical content. It could be, you know, uh, it could be things as subtle as, you know, different rhythms in the background. Um, anything that was reflective of, you know, the South Bronx kind of upbringing. It, or the answer could be no, you know, um, it could be as simple as that. <clears throat> I don't know if there was. I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I don't think it was, it wasn't anything we were hearing. Yeah, that's right. You know? We weren't drawing it from anybody else. It wasn't it wasn't something that you could say, hey, I heard somebody in the neighborhood doing this and I think that'd be something to look into or trying or it it didn't really come off like that. It was yeah. so much of its own thing and so different than everything else. Like there was nothing we knew that sounded like that. Yeah, yeah. Um and, and again, even in the neighborhood, um, you know, anybody who knew us who heard it. You know, there weren't. There was nothing to compare it to. They weren't like, "Oh, you guys are like," because nobody listened. Um, so there there wasn't anything to really compare it to and say, "Oh, you know, if you did this, you sound like this." To us, maybe because we were into the scene, but not yeah, to sure. not to anybody else, because nobody listened to to that kind of music. I mean, we were really on an island. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You know, even, the mind that played in bands even like like even like with jimmy who had 24 7 spies um his stuff wasn't like that um it had heavy parts but when i first went to see him um and i went to see them a couple of times before they got signed even because i yeah. knew him from the they weren't heavy at all yeah it wasn't until later that they got a heavier edge to them but at first they were not heavy at all um, almost had no distortion. 